Yeah. <laughs> now we're showing Tommy Boy. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you this morning. It's nice that he could go from gym and taxi to a scientist. You have to think a lot to get that joke, so it's okay. It's not much of a joke. That's all we got. So today we're going to talk about stress. How many of you ever feel stressed? All right. Anybody who doesn't have their hand up, would you get paddles and just get them, give them a restart? Uh, everybody has stress and deals with stress. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to give you just some practical life advice that this one thing alone might reduce your stress tremendously. Um, we're going to talk about my yard. So, so here's what I want you to know. So um, if you have a lawn that you're trying to make green, some of you have given up. Uh, in Miami, there's actually a guy, I remember in Coral Gables, because we drive by on the school bus, and he cemented his whole yard and bronzed his lawnmower and put it in the middle on like a little pedestal. When you went by, it was cement and thing. And then other people put AstroTurf in which, you know, is not real grass, and you can tell. But, um, but my yard looked great five years ago when I first moved in. And uh, it had brand new grass. It was perfect. I mean, there was, every blade was green. There was not a defect. And they had a lawn service come out that would spray every month. And then one day I said, you know, I don't need that lawn service anymore to spray. I did. Um, so what happened is all the mole crickets in the yards around me had a meeting. And the meeting went like this. There's some nice green grass over there. And all the poison is gone. Go. And within months, uh, two-thirds of my front yard was wiped out. Of course, I didn't know it was mole crickets. I, uh, I don't know, it looked like somebody had carpet bombed my front yard. And so I realized that and I began going to the store and buying different things. Listen, if you maintain your yard, you can't just leave it alone or it dies. Some of you have experienced this and continue to experience it at your house, right? If you don't do anything, weeds will take over or nothing will take over because if you don't do anything, nothing grows. But I also realized I can't make grass grow. I know that might be a shocker to you, okay? So in my yard, there's bald spots, but it's, it's almost looking green. I've actually left a few weeds because they fill in nicely in certain areas, you know? So, but I use this stuff, uh, uh, which is evil, uh, kills weeds, not the yard. And then this is for my roses. I actually use my organite on my yard which I would not bring to church because it smells to high heaven. And that, that's kind of funny for church, high heaven. Anyway, so, but this is what I use on my roses and it actually fertilizes them and, and also takes care of pests, all that kind of stuff. And here's the deal about yards. So there are things I have to do and here's what I'm trying to do for my yard. And, and this is where we're, we're gonna come back around with it for you. I can create an environment in my yard for grass to grow, but I can't make grass grow. If you came by my house, my group, we got, we got our last small group tonight. If you came by my house tonight and you come to small group, and if I was in the front yard down on my knees going, come on grass, let's go, let's get it together. Or I was pulling just slowly thinking I'm helping the grass to stretch out. They would take me to the hospital knowing that the sun, right? But however, if they saw me raking or applying fertilizer, they would say that's a good thing or watering and you got to do all that in the right amounts. Here's the deal. Let's just look at it in life, okay? Whether it's your family or your job. There are many things in life. Okay, let's, let's talk about couples first. If you're married or you're dating, you ready? You cannot make someone love you. You can't make them love you. But you can provide an environment for love. And next week I'm going to talk about anger. I may actually do a video shoot from my front yard. I'm thinking about it. But, but listen, you can also make big mistakes. One day I was mowing, and in the middle of mowing, my lawnmower ran out of gas. 
I thought, well, I'll just fill it right here in the middle of the yard. You know already what I did, don't you? Don't you? I thought I was a perfect gas pourer. I blame the gas can. These new gas cans with all this air stuff and, you know, just give me a nozzle. What do I got to push stuff to let gas out, right? So I'm holding the little thingy and pushing, and you got to hold one leg up now. And the gas goes all over the grass. And to this day, when I walk past that spot, I go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and I know I need to dig it up and you replace the soil and call hazmat team and you know, whatever. You can do that in life. If you say angry, hurtful words, you can burn a relationship. You can burn a relationship with people. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. Even when you ask forgiveness, if you really go toxic, it takes a longer time for that to heal. Also, if you're on the other side of that, you cannot force somebody to be nice. You cannot force them to do anything. Once they hit teenage years, you can't force them to do anything. You can make them miserable. You can create an environment that encourages work by saying, this was what happens. Here's the good things that happen if you do the things you're supposed to do. And here's the bad things that happen when you don't do what you're supposed to do. But you still cannot force them to do it. But you can create an environment, or what we're going to talk about in, in September, you can create a boundary that helps them to understand. So in your job, for example, you cannot keep them from firing you. But you can create an environment. You can be such a good employee that the tendency is they don't want to fire you. You can also be such an employee that they want to fire you. You can create a loving environment in your home where love is fostered and cared about, or you can create a toxic environment where anytime there's spiteful words and hateful words and hurtful words. Here's the other thing you need to realize. Some of you are stressed out because there are people in your life that you can't control, whether it's a neighbor or a friend or a relative or a situation. And here's the deal. You can provide an environment, but you cannot do anything to change that situation. And that's where you have to realize that you are not God. And so do your best in life to create the environments God has for you. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says the horse is prepared for the battle, but the battle belongs to the Lord. And what that means is you're supposed to do your part. You can't just expect your marriage to be okay when you just let it go. It's just like a yard. Mole crickets will get in. Things will destroy. Weeds will come in. You, you won't, can't have a good relationship with your children without doing some things. But the truth is, there will be times that summer comes and the grass doesn't look good. Or there's drought. And you do the best you can to create an environment. But what they choose to do, you have to let them do it. Here's the deal. When you try to control things that God didn't put in your control, you will stress yourself out. When you watch the news over and over, thinking that somehow watching the news is going to help you to control events in the world, you will wear yourself out and be stressed out over things that you can do nothing about. So today what we're going to look at is we're going to look at this idea of stress. And I want you to know this. Listen, you can't control things. And because you think you can control things, sometimes you don't rest. Sometimes you never relax. Some of you right now are working out a problem that you can do nothing about. As we sit here, and you're not even listening. Because you're thinking about that. Psalms 23 is going to really help you. Sometimes we don't even take time to pray because we're so busy. Does that make any sense? So I want you to start out today very simply um, realizing that you're not God, and he is, but I need you to uh, remind your neighbor. So you're going to turn to your neighbor and going to just remind them you're not God. Okay, go for it. That'll be fun. All right, so let me give you some caveats about stress, okay? Why it's okay to have some stress. 
So we see stress as evil, but stress is not really the problem. Number one, it's a natural response to a challenge. If I, for some crazy reason, decided, you know, I want to teach you about stress, so I'm going to release a bear in the back of the room. Don't worry, it's not happening. So if you're like looking around, he would do that. Our pastor would do. Okay, hopefully you'd have enough stress to get up and run out of the room, right? That's good stress. So stress can be good. Number two, every character in the Bible had stress. Jesus was so stressed out that it says that he, he uh, sweat blood. And by the way, years ago, uh, there were people who wanted to say the Bible was wrong, and they would say, see, that's proof the Bible's wrong, because people don't sweat blood. And guess what they figured out? That under extreme stress, there's a condition where people sweat blood. I'm sure when David took on Goliath, it wasn't like, oh, this is going to be a fun day. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're carried up a hill to a fiery furnace that's so hot that the guys, the soldiers, the big dudes that were carrying them went one, two, and died as they threw them in the fire. I don't know about you, but I want God to release me before I get up the hill. They actually were in the fire before the ropes were let loose. I don't know about you. I'd be like, okay, God, even on two, one, two would be good. Three, and you're in the fire. I'm sure they were stressed out. They made a statement that was awesome. They said, they said, King, we won't bow to you because our God will save us. And then they said, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow to you. Which is like, we think he's going to save us. But we're... <laughs> Number three, if we respond properly, stress can be helpful. There's times that stress will make you sharper. Those of you who've had that last-minute term paper due or that last-minute sermon due. Oh, wait. <laughs> it can be helpful. It can sharpen you. Number four, it can help us to reach out to others. Actually, the same chemical released when you give a hug is released when you're under stress. And so oxytocin, I think is how you pronounce it. And, and it's the idea that your body has figured out you need help. Number five, God can use stress to help us to trust him. Because there will become a point in your life where you realize you can't do it by yourself. Now, here's a study that was done. You can look this up later. This the reason I put it in here. Pennsylvania State University found that stress was not the problem, but how we react to stressors. In other words, stressors aren't the problem, but how you deal with them. They actually did this questionnaire. It was a pretty large study. And here's what they discovered. People who thought stress was not bad were like... 45% more likely to not have early heart attacks or die unexpectedly. Whereas people who thought stress were, was bad were more likely to have stress-related issues, like way more likely. So here's what I want you to repeat after me. Ready? Stress is not bad. Stress is not bad. I just saved your life. I saved your life. You're all good. All right. So here's seven spiritual habits that reduce stress from Psalms 23. And you can actually take Psalms 23, take these notes, put them in your car, and walk through it. A lot of you have it memorized. It's a great one. Number one, look to God to meet my needs. Meet my needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. And then in Philippians 4.19 it says, And my God will meet all your wants. Oh, wait, it didn't say wants. Meet all your needs according to the riches of glory in Christ Jesus. Listen. We are wants people, not needs people. So this verse says he'll meet all your needs. Exactly. But too many of us, too many of us, we live in a society that we think wants our needs. We mix them up. So, so we're, uh, we're driving a car that's 20 years old. Okay? And we're driving this car. We're keeping it together with, with bailing wire and duct tape. Right? And we see a commercial about a car that can parallel park itself and we think i need a car that can parallel park itself even though we haven't parallel parked in 20 years and there's only three parallel parking spaces in brevard county and they're all in titusville where we don't go <laughs> they really are there's three i would never park there it's like the dumbest place but i'm sure somebody with their car like i need the car so i can park right there I could park right, I, I wouldn't have to walk an extra 20 feet if I could park right there. So they go out and spend $400 a month on a car that they don't need, but they want. Even worse, 
You know what one of the, I think it's number two, but it may be number one. You know what one of the number one reasons people buy certain cars is? Cup holders. Cup holders, absolutely true. Like, it's like, we gotta have two for each person. I mean, McDonald's gives you the thing to hold. You just put it in the seat next to you. Have you not figured this thing out? I mean, they even make something that you can put on your window if you need to. I'll be honest with you. When all the cup holders are full, can I tell you that means that I've got empty cups in my car? And if I had less cup holders, I would probably take the cups in. Okay, no, I wouldn't. I'd put them on the floorboard and listen to them clink for a couple days. Then i take them in. But the truth is, we see something as a need that's a want. And, and let me just give you, this is a pastor warning. You ready? If you want to know if a pastor's not a good teacher, listen when they talk about God's provision being a want. When they say, if you have God's... Hey, wait, i got to do it with a country accent. Ready? <clears throat> now, I want to tell you something about Jesus. If you have God's favor, favor... Then when you fly on an airline, they're going to bump you up to first class because God just wants to show you that he just loves you. You got his favor. And you're going to be driving into the mall and you're going to see that front parking space just right there. Right there. You're going to pull right in. That person's going to pull. You're going to be right there and it's going to show you God loves you. By the way, one of the guys who taught that is at a really big church, and he actually had to take it back because everybody was trying to get the front parking space at his church and then coming to him and going, I guess I don't have God's favor today, Pastor. I had to park. At our church, can I tell you what we do? When people get here early, they park as far away from the building as they can. Jesus said, don't take the first places. So we've got to be careful when we teach that wants our needs and somehow claim that if God provides these wants, that we're more spiritual. You know, if we have a gold toilet in our house, that means we're better Christians. We've mixed all this up. And so we're exhausted. Why? Because we're saying, God, I have this want. And so we're working for cup holders and parallel parking. I talked to somebody this morning who said they have $800 in car payments right now. That's a lot of cup holders. <laughs> so what are you seeking to meet your needs? Are you asking God to meet your needs or are you trying to seek them? Are you looking for a person, for entertainment, for a movie, grandkids? I mean, they might make you happy for a little while, Bob, but you know. <laughs> Is it love? Is it a person? If it's a person, not only are you going to be disappointed, they are. Number two, take time to rest my body and mind. Most of you have not done this this week. He makes me lie down. I love how it says he makes me. Because let me tell you something about your body. If you choose to never rest, your body will decide. It's time to make you lie down. So you'll find yourself sick. You'll find yourself, you wear yourself out, you will eventually stop. One way or the other. Now, sometimes the reason we never stop is because we think our life should please everyone else. So we're going to be talking about boundaries in September, but listen to this first. Jesus always had people coming to him. Listen to how busy they were. Then, because so many people, this is Jesus and the disciples, were coming and going, they did not even have a chance to eat. Time out. Can I be honest with you? I have too much time to eat. <laughs> Yesterday I was home, I had a thing of almonds, almonds on the counter. And I'd walk by and I'd take a couple almonds. Man, those were good. And I'd walk by again. I'd go, oh, those are, I'm going to have a few more of those. Right? And we, and we find that we have too much. They didn't even have time to put food in their mouth. So what happens? Jesus said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. When is the last time you took one hour and put your phone away? And turned off the news. And went and sat somewhere. You live in a beautiful area. People come here. I, I go kayaking. And people tell me, this is beautiful. You must really enjoy it. And, and the number of us that drive down US-1 and go, and never go, well, that's pretty. Mm -hmm. You stop at a light and you, you never take a chance. US-1 here is gorgeous. You, you've never even noticed because you've never gotten still. You're always in a hurry. You're always pushing. You're always going. By the way, the enemy will always push you. Always push for everything. 
Always. When you feel that rush all the time, it's not God. That's not God. Boundaries will allow you to rest, to get some balance in your life. Number three, recharge my soul with worship and fellowship. Let me tell you something about Psalms 23 that most people miss. It says God is our shepherd. You're not his only sheep. Sheep travel in flocks. They travel together. They need each other. There's safety. There's comfort. There's encouragement with each other. And when we worship together, there's something special about it. The Bible says, he, here we go again, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. When you take time to worship, God refreshes you. Worship is not just music. Music can help. So as you're singing these songs, you really ought to make them prayers to the Lord. But worship can happen while you're sitting there right now, that you're just thankful to God for what you have. Worship can happen when you for take five minutes to pull over uh, during the day and look at the water and say, God, thank you for water and fish and birds and the beautiful sunrise or sunset or the rain. You know, it's funny. We, we, we prayed for rain and then it rains and we go, oh, it's raining. <laughs> Bunch of weirdos. <laughs> you know how I know that? Because I said, oh, we can't let the dogs out, it's raining. <laughs> but let it not rain for another month and we'd all be going, hoo -hoo, we'd dance out there. <laughs> Philippians 4 8, you'll do best by filling with your minds and meditating on things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. What do you focus on? If you want to change any relationship in your life, work on gratitude. Sandra did a marriage retreat this weekend. And one of the things she said is, um, uh, uh, this is very revealing, but she said my, her husband sheds. And so she goes into the, into the bathroom and there's hair in the sink. And she said she has a choice at this point to go, I wish she'd clean up his hair. Or to say, I'm glad I have a husband. Some of you are like, I, neither of those works for me, right? <laughs> but the truth is, how we think about things makes such a difference. You know, we get busy with life and we don't take time to look people in the eyes. We don't take time to get still and to listen to what somebody says, to put our hand on somebody's shoulder, to thank them for who they are. We're not grateful for what we have. And the reason is not because we don't have a lot. It's because we've not focused our minds on the right thing. We look and it's never enough. And we have to instead say gratitude. You want to change any relationship, your job, your workplace, your church, be grateful for what you have. I want to do a little exercise real quick. We're going to try something. I want you to close your eyes. Some of you are like, I have been. <laughs> I want you to close your eyes for just a minute. I want you to think of your favorite place in nature, whether it's a mountain or a stream or the ocean or maybe something else. I want you to just place yourself there. I want you to just take a moment to thank God for everything that you see. Now I want you to take a deep breath. All right, now open your eyes back to reality. Yep, this is what you get right here. All right, sorry. Some of you are stressed out just from looking up here. But isn't it amazing how just in those few moments you can feel God's refresh? He created nature for a purpose. Just being in nature helps us to relax. They've even found that school children, when they put a poster of nature on the wall, not the cat hanging by a thread, but when they put a poster of nature on the wall, just the poster helps kids to relax. Some of you need to trade out some of the posters in your cubicle, right? Number four, ask God for guidance. He guides me along the path for his name sake. James 1 5 says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it'll be given to you. When's the last time you prayed for wisdom? When's the last time you opened your Bible and when you saw a verse that meant something, you said, God, show me what that means to me. Help me to obey you. Number five, seek God in the valleys and obey. We're pretty good when things get hard to say, God, I really need you. 
Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, too often we think of God with a staff hitting us. The staff by a shepherd was not used to beat the sheep. It was used to keep enemies away. But he did use it to guide the sheep. Hey, watch out for that. And God, if you're a believer, there are times that God will tap you. My pastor at home used to say, he'll tap you. And if he doesn't get your attention, he'll tap you a little harder, right? So, you know, we got to come to an end of ourselves and say, God, in the valley, when it's dark, help me to know your presence. Help me to know you love me. In Romans 12, 21, it says it this way. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So let's go back to the environment analogy. You ready? So somebody in your house continues to say negative things. You can retaliate by saying negative things and create a toxic, and you can spill the gas <laughs> all over the yard. You just, you just make it worse and worse, or you can say, I'm not going to give in to that environment. I'm going to say what's kind. Instead of upping the ante and saying what's sarcastic and thinking we're in competition, and what did you do, and what did you do, and what did you do? And by the way, people are great at that. We love to verbally spar with people. Instead of that, we say, I'm not going to be overcome by evil. I'm going to overcome evil with good. Now, you don't look at them and say that sarcastically, by the way. That doesn't help either. I'm going to be more spiritual than you are. <laughs> right? That's when you get punched in the face. It hurts. It hurts. We tend to justify sin in the valleys. If somebody does something to us, we think, well, they deserve that. But we have to learn to forgive and to give grace, to receive his grace, and do what he says in the valley. Number six, let God heal me when I'm attacked. You prepare a table before me, listen to this, in the presence of my enemies. It means you fill me spiritually even when the enemies are all around me. And then it goes on. It says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This oil was for healing. You may right now have a wound that somebody gave you. Maybe somebody's attacked you and hurt your feelings or your emotions or you're dealing with something right now that's just really raw. Listen, begin to pray. God, I know you've let me sit at your table. Would you heal me? God, would you help me to forgive that person? I'm not saying you have to hang around that person. I'm not saying you have to say what that person did was right. But God can heal you from someone who's hurt you. In 1 Peter 5.10 it says, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. I wish that wasn't in there. I wanted to say, after you've had an awesome life and nothing ever went wrong. In the Bible, you know, it talks about refiner's fire. I keep praying, Lord, just give me a refiner's jacuzzi. I don't, it's, the fire's too hard. I'd like life to be easy. But life's just hard sometimes. And so it continues. After you've suffered a little while, what's going to happen? He himself will restore you, and listen, make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That pain you've been through, that trial you're going through, that difficulty you've gone through, that time when the people attacked you and they took whatever from you, God is the one who's going to restore, not only restore you, but listen, he's going to make you stronger. He's going to make you more steady. He's going to make you have it more to get to know for sure that he is there in the good times because he was there in the bad times. To know his presence when you trust him in the difficulty. Number seven, pursue God each day because he knows tomorrow. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. This is really cool because this word for follow me is the word like an animal pursuing somebody to kill them. It's a negative word normally, but it's awesome. It's like, God, you love me so much that your love and your mercy or your goodness is going to pursue me forever. That's how much God loves you. He pursues you with his love. And then it said, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what's going to happen on the worst day of your life? If you're a believer and you have a really bad day and you die, you'll be in heaven. The worst day of your life will be the best day of your life. Three years ago when I was in the hospital and I was doing IV antibiotics and they sent me home for months with uh, IV antibiotics that I had to take two times a day. The doctor said, if this doesn't work, you will die. <laughs> He actually told me not too long ago that he thought I was going to die. And I knew my worst day, if this infection took over and killed me, that I would wake up in heaven one day and go, man, hey, cousin, I thought you were dead. Oh, that was pretty nice. Good to see you again. 
Seek first God's kingdom, Jesus said, and what God wants, then all your other needs will be met as well. So don't worry about tomorrow. Because tomorrow will have its own worries. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't waste time on worry. When you find yourself worrying, take whatever that is and put it before God. Go out and sit in nature and say, God, thank you for what I have. And be grateful for what you have. And you'll find that those worries fade into the distance. You can prepare an environment in life. There are things you can do something about. But so much of life, you just have to let the grass grow. You just have to let God do his work on people especially, but also on things. And say, God, I can't make this person change, but I can create an environment where they're allowed to change. I can't make that person love more, but I can create an environment. I can't make that child do what you want them to do, but I can be there for them and create that environment. Remember, you're not God, but he is. Find yourself stressed out this week. Take Psalms 23 and just walk through it. Just walk through Psalms 23 and say, The Lord is my shepherd. Lord, you're my shepherd. I won't want. You make me lie down in green pastures. You lead me beside quiet waters. You restore my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear any evil for you're with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And one day... I will live in your house forever. When you struggle with stress, you realize God's in charge. You can allow him to make the changes. And you just be obedient to him and rest in him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, that's the first step to walking in his rest is to receive him. If you're here and you're a Christian and you have never uh, really walked in his rest, I encourage you to begin to say, God, help me to rest in you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, we're going to have an offering or time of giving in a moment. And I'll be here after that. And you can say, Eric, I want to give my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here and you're a believer. I want to encourage you. Take this passage with you this week. When you find yourself stressed out, say, stress isn't bad. I'm going to trust you, God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word and your power. Lord, I thank you that no matter what happens to us, that you said even in front of our enemies, you would prepare a table. Even in front of our enemies, you would heal us. And so, Lord, I pray you would do that for those here. Father, for those who are going through very difficult times, I pray as a church we could surround them and show them your love. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I bless the rest of this time in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a great song to, uh, to end the service today and some great videos to remind you of God's love. And, and gratitude for him. You give what God's put on your heart today. Thanks for being here this morning.